There are many miles of undiscovered areas beneath the crust we can't even come close to. Scientists found what appears to be underground mountains buried inside the mantle. Our planet is divided into three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust is where 8 billion people, trillions of trees, and millions of animals live and thrive. There are also different types of crust in the land and the ocean. The oceanic crust contains unique rocks and is denser than the land crust. We all see how the Earth is divided and color-coded to show the crust, mantle, and core in textbooks. But there are also special layers in between that not everyone talks about. The mantle is divided into the upper and lower part, which is the transition zone. Since the mantle acts as the geological recycling center, the plate tectonics don't only move side to side, but up and down. It's actually why all the volcanoes appeared. The magma spews out to the surface or even underwater, and then sinks back down and repeats. The transitions go down 250 miles and then 410 miles. And in this bottom layer, scientists keep discovering the hidden landscapes. The mountains in the mantle are more rugged and much larger than the ones on the crust. Scientists found a mountain range with peaks higher than Mount Everest. Some of them are as high as 600 miles. When the continents were still landlocked together, there may have been some hidden lands now underwater. Theories suggest that Iceland used to be part of a larger microcontinent, Icelandia, which connected present-day Iceland with Greenland and Scandinavia. The idea digs even deeper to a greater Icelandia, which includes Britain. But after the split, these bigger lands sunk with everything in it. There are also theories about New Zealand being part of Zealandia, a hidden microcontinent within the same region. So it could be that these mountains used to be part of old Earth that are underground over the billions of years of natural occurrences. But still, it isn't very likely. One theory is that these underground mountain ranges could be leftover slabs of rock that descended from the surface to the transition zone from the moving of the tectonic plates. As they sink, the large pieces break down into smaller ones. And as they compile over the millions of years, they form what appears to be underground mountains. Since the mantle is the geologic recycling zone, it's likely that the rocks down there used to be part of the surface. They weren't large pieces of land that got hidden, just like dogs hide bones in the garden. But it takes way more time to hide mountains. Some parts of the mantle appear to be smooth, while others aren't so much. The parts that have a cluster of rocks could contain hidden elements in the underground mountains. The smoother parts don't have much seismic or volcanic activity, while the rough parts do. The best way to study those underground landscapes is to wait for an earthquake or a volcano eruption to happen. Seismologists can observe the Earth's interior with special scanners, just like doctors use ultrasound to examine a patient. They can even see minor details and not huge chunks of rocks. A strong enough earthquake can send shockwaves to the Earth's interior, even through the core and back up to the surface. Depending on where they occur, Seismologists can observe and study the intensity of the waves as they move back and forth. On smooth rocks, the waves can travel in a straight line, but once they reach a rough area, the waves tend to scatter. The temperature and composition of the materials can make the waves move faster or slower. But this info isn't exactly accurate and won't contribute a lot to the actual data of the underground mountains. So by analyzing the scattered waves on ships, and utilizing the Earth's magnetic field, scientists can figure out everything they need to know. But these studies are only good enough to figure out the interior in today's state, not how the Earth changed over the past 4.5 billion years. However, scientists are certain that mantle material still dates back to the beginning of Earth's original formation. The question, why not just dig a hole to the center of the Earth and see what's going on down there, might seem logical. The deepest hole humans have dug so far is the Kola Deep Borehole in the Russian Arctic that goes more than 40,000 feet deep. The locals claim they can actually hear screaming coming from below. It took almost 20 years to drill as far as they went, 
but it's literally merely scratching the surface of what's underneath. They dug about one third of the crust, which is only 0.2% to the center of the Earth. Getting there is beyond us, just like trying to reach the sun. No human can handle the amount of pressure down there. Going down the Mariana Trench, the Earth's deepest point, requires special gear to withstand all the immense pressure. It'll cost a fortune to build that tech to get us to the center of our planet. Evidence of diamonds buried deep in Brazil shows that everything we do on the crust's surface can affect things miles below, even towards the mantle. Scientists dug up six diamonds that could hold tiny mineral grains. As they're called in the mineral world, these inclusions have a chemistry composition where they originated deep in the Earth. Typical diamonds are formed at depths less than 125 miles in the upper mantle, where it's extremely hot. The high pressure and boiling temperature down crystallizes carbon and creates diamonds. But humans can't dig all the way down there. They mine them by detecting where a deep volcanic eruption happened that expelled these diamonds to the surface. These eruptions occurred millions of years ago, when dinosaurs used to rule the Earth. They shot out the diamonds that were in the mantle and are now embedded within the cooled down volcanic material. And that's where people mine them. But these special diamonds found in Brazil originated from a much deeper point than usual, which can further help scientists study the depths of the Earth. They can extract these inclusions and analyze them in a lab to tell where exactly these minerals come from. In the lab, scientists study inclusions, each just 15 to 40 microns wide, less than a quarter width of a human hair. They found out that they contained many types of minerals found in volcanic rock on the surface. The carbon composition of the magma from the surface is much different than the ones deep in the Earth. What's crazy is that these diamonds with special inclusions can only be found 435 miles in the lower mantle. With only a few samples of them found, we don't know what else lies beneath us. It's possible that those mountain ranges underground, taller than Mount Everest, can have traces of diamonds all around, which would prompt excavators to dig them up and saturate the market with them. These diamonds are less flawed than the usual ones and might even come in many sizes. It's possible to see diamonds as large as a car or as small as a grain of rice. There might even be new diamonds with different chemical compositions than the ones we find near the surface. The largest diamond in the world is the Cullinan, which can fit in the palm of your hand. It weighs around 1.3 pounds and is 3,100 carats. It was found in 1905 in South Africa. For anything to exist on Earth, you need carbon. In a nutshell, the carbon cycle is when plants and algae release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or dissolved in water through photosynthesis. It's converted into carbohydrates and stored as fat. Later on, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere through breathing, which the plants benefit from, and the cycle goes on. Scientists claim that there might even be a carbon cycle in Earth's interior. The oceanic crust has a lot of carbon sediment that could mix with the upper and lower mantle layer. But there still isn't enough evidence to support this. The deep diamonds might be the key to popping open that theory. Only time will tell. So, you've just finished your sightseeing tour of Edinburgh, Scotland, or Scotland. It lasted just under an hour, and you're hungry for more. You ask your guide if there's anything else to see, and they start talking about a mysterious underground city. You ask how long it takes to get there, and you're shocked by the guide's answer. You're standing on it. It's right under your feet. South Bridge? But you were just there and didn't notice a giant arrow pointing down. Hmm. So this is where the mystery starts. The story begins in the mid-1700s. The Scottish capital wasn't as big as it is today. Only 60,000 people lived around Edinburgh Castle. All of them were packed inside medieval walls. And they say today's cities are overpopulated. Get a load of the living conditions back then. The buildings were tall, so there was little natural light. Some houses had 14 stories. Cows walked the narrow winding streets and left stuff. Things were so bad that the famous English writer Daniel Defoe noted, I believe that in no city in the world, so many people have so little room. Yep, that's the guy who wrote Robinson Crusoe. 
Well, something just had to be done. The solution was to build two long bridges to the north and to the south of the city. The names they gave the bridges were more descriptive than colorful. The bridge to the north was completed first. In 1785, construction on the second bridge got underway. It was going to connect the main pedestrian street in the north with the university buildings in the south of Edinburgh. But don't think of this construction as a modern bridge over a river. It was more of a viaduct, a type of bridge that connects two hills across a valley. The word viaduct comes from Latin, as Romans were pioneers in building these structures. Their capital was built on seven hills. And just to be copycats, Edinburgh also straddled seven major hills. Only two are visible today because the city has been built up. Now, back in the 18th century, the construction of the South Bridge was a remarkable feat of engineering. It took the builders only three years to complete it. 19 stone arches spanned a chasm that was 31 feet at its deepest point, and the length, over a thousand feet. Impressive, even for today's standards. But what does a two and a half centuries old viaduct have to do with an underground city? Well, it is the city. You see, they designed Southbridge to be hollow on the inside. As you walk along this street today, there is actually a huge human-made cave beneath your feet. The popular name for this set of chambers is the Edinburgh Vaults. But what was the purpose of this space? And is there something or someone there now? Well, let's take it one step at a time. The builder's original intention was for these vaults to serve as merchant shops. At first, it worked out fine. Merchants used a total of 120 vaults as shops and warehouses. There were workshops, cobblers, and taverns. But as time went by, a major design flaw came to light. The stone was leaking, and the vaults were damp all the time. There was even flooding. The builders forgot to waterproof the structure. The merchants feared the water would damage their precious goods. After just a couple of years, the first tenants started moving out. Once legal trade moved away from the vaults, the city's poor moved in. And not only them, but all sorts of shady characters. Historians don't know much about this period, since there are no written records. But even the squatters had to leave soon. If you couldn't do business in these vaults, how could you live in them? It was damp and cold, and there was no ventilation, sanitation, or natural light. It really stunk. Every real estate agent's worst nightmare. Just 30 years after their completion, the Southbridge vaults were abandoned once and for all. But at a street level, business was as usual. The officials decided to fill the vaults with rubble for security purposes. Buried and forgotten, the memory of a once teeming merchant quarter of Edinburgh slowly faded from people's minds. Now, this is where the story gets a bit weird. During the 1980s, a Scottish rugby player accidentally found a tunnel leading into the vaults. The athlete didn't waste any time and started excavating the vaults with the help of his son. Several tons of rubble and, a decade later, the Southbridge vaults have been restored to their former glory, so to speak. They were again dark and damp, as they were back in the 1700s. There were many interesting finds in this underground city. The vaults were littered with oyster shells, which were the standard diet for a working-class resident of Edinburgh at the time. Other finds, such as shoes and empty bottles, suggested that people actually lived in these claustrophobic vaults. Think of this the next time you see someone trying to rent their garage as an apartment. So, your guide was right. There really is a hidden city under the streets of Edinburgh. Well, at least one street. You have now gone down from the main pedestrian street into Cowgate. You look up and there it is, the only visible arch of the once impressive bridge. You are now searching online to book a tour of the vaults. You just have to see this place with your own eyes. But the Scottish capital isn't the only city with a mysterious underground. The historic region of Cappadocia in central Turkey hides no less than 36 cities beneath the ground. The biggest and the most impressive one wasn't discovered until 1963. It was built during the Byzantine era to protect the local population from invaders. 
We have similar structures made out of concrete in our cities, but the level of the Turkish underground city is really impressive. There are several levels, like in a multi-story car garage. The caves and tunnels lie 197 feet underground. That's two-thirds of the Statue of Liberty's height. The city could house 20,000 people at any given time, complete with livestock and food. Mmm, the smell. Anyway, 20,000 is the average attendance at Major League Soccer matches today. You might want to add a field trip to one of these places the next time you go to Turkey. Most of these cities in Cappadocia can be found in rural areas. Makes sense, right? After all, they were dug out as hiding places. But in Europe, there is one city whose underground labyrinth resembles the vaults of Edinburgh. You've probably heard of Pilsen in the Czech Republic. But hold on a second, this isn't going to be a story of the most famous local product. Something brewed, perhaps? It's the story of a medieval city that survived underneath the streets of Pilsen. Water wells, cellars, and passageways stretch for more than 12 miles. Merchants and craftspeople use Pilsen's historical underground for storage. Water, food, ice, you name it. The waterworks are pretty impressive. Historians estimate that 360 wells are located under Pilsen's historical town center. In times of instability, the passageways served as safe havens for the locals. They definitely didn't go thirsty down there. Today, most tourists visit these mysterious underground cities. But in Canada, there's one where people live and work. The construction of Montreal's underground city began in 1962. The initial idea was to shelter traffic. That's a nice way to say that city officials were building a metro station. The idea caught on, and the project expanded. Now, it's a real-life urban maze hidden under the downtown area. Need a place to stay? There are hotels down there. Want to grab a bite? Step into one of the underground restaurants. Multiple shops, a library, cinemas, the list is long. There are even residential complexes. But how can people live under the ground? Simple. Although the city itself lies beneath the earth, the access points are at ground level. You can enter the 20-mile-long tunnel network at more than 120 places. Oh, that's another place down under. Oops, sorry, Australia. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.